And then through that, we were like, you know, this is pretty great. So we started the Claire Bear Foundation. We do safe sleep advocacy. We provide safe sleep spaces for families that can't afford them because I don't think that finances, it's not fair that that might make or break whether a family is able to be as safe as possible as they want. And then we also do a lot of work with Child Care Aware of Washington and Child Care Aware of America with advocacy for safe, accessible, affordable child care for all families. And so we go to Washington, D.C. typically each spring and speak to lawmakers about funding for childcare and how important it is. Welcome to Raising Adults, the groundbreaking parenting podcast that starts with the end in mind. We're your co-hosts, Dina Thayer and Kira Dorian. We created future-focused parenting to take families from surviving to thriving. So join us as we help you stop raising kids and start raising adults. Hey there, Raising Adults listeners. We just wanted to give you a brief heads up about the forthcoming episode. There is some discussion of infant loss on this episode. It is specifically related to unsafe sleep practices, but we wanted to give you that warning nonetheless, uh, as it may be a trigger for some people. So be aware that there will be some brief discussion of infant loss related to unsafe sleep practices, including a personal story. We sincerely hope that you will still listen to the episode and share it with those for whom it might apply. Welcome FFPs to another episode of Raising Adults podcast. Kira is there in the laundry room. You can't see, but I'm gesturing and I'm under my staircase in the coat closet. So how are you today, Kira? (laughs) I'm doing okay. I got a dog for anybody who follows us on social media. They will have seen over the break. I got a dog and let me tell you, life with a dog is different. (laughs) but I'm hanging in. How are you? Yeah, that's a definite adjustment for sure. I'm doing well and I'm pretty excited for this episode because I'm a sleep consultant. So, you know, this is kind of my wheelhouse, but this side of it we haven't covered before. So today we have Shana Raphael with us and she's going to talk about sleep safety and safe sleep. And it's just such an important topic. I mean, I help families get better sleep and help their little ones sleep so that the adults can sleep. But I think the sleep safety thing, we really can't overlook it. And she's a wealth of knowledge, but she also brings some really firsthand personal experience to it. So we're glad to have her. Shana, say hello. Hello. We're so glad you're here. I'm going to introduce you a little more formally, and then we'll talk because we do want to dive right in and really reap the benefits of what you have to share with us today. So I'm going to introduce her and then we're going to chat about sleep safety today and what you all as parents should know. And we do hope you'll share this with other people in your lives too, because they may be in a situation where they're looking for a care provider, or maybe they have a little one and are just kind of on the front end of learning about all this. Or I think expectant parents too, that's a really good time to learn on the front end. So please feel free to share the episode widely. We recognize that it might not exactly apply to each of you listening, but we're willing to bet you know someone for whom it applies. So please share it, share it around. That's, that's our goal. All right, let me introduce our guest today. Shana Raphael is a wife, mother of three, and special education consultant behavioral specialist from the South Puget Sound. After losing her 10 and a half month old daughter, Claire, in 2015 from unsafe sleep at childcare, Shana dove into the world of advocacy work. She and her husband partnered with their local children's hospital to provide a high tech CPR resuscitation simulation room, collaborating with the medical personnel who tried to save their daughter. In 2019, she and her husband founded the Claire Bear Foundation while continuing partnerships with other child safety organizations and providing both advocacy and safe sleep spaces for families in need of support. Shana also works with Child Care Aware of America each year, speaking to lawmakers in Washington, D.C. on the importance of licensed, affordable, safe, and accessible child care for all families. So Shana, welcome so much to Raising Adults. We're so glad to have you with us on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. So we always like to start with our why. Whenever we tackle a parenting topic on the podcast, we 
Kira and I will talk about our intention that we're bringing to that issue and share our why. And then we break it down and talk about nuts and bolts and get into the whys and hows. So we're hoping you would do the same. So if you just introduce yourself a little bit more, tell us about the Claire Bear Foundation and your why. What's the why behind the work you're doing? Sure. Um, Well, the work I'm doing isn't something that I initially sought out or knew lots of information about. I was kind of thrown involuntarily into the world of safe sleep. Back in April in 2015, on my 31st birthday, I had taken the day off to spend some time with my older daughter. My husband took our youngest, Claire, who was 10 and a half months at the time, to the in-home child care that she'd been going to since she was about three months old. Her older sister went there as an infant as well. And We just thought it was a normal day. And a few hours later, I was out um, shopping with my oldest, and I started to get phone calls from my mom. She called a few times, um, but that is not atypical of my mom to call a few times. So I figured it was just about um, a little family barbecue we were going to do for my birthday that evening. But then my husband called me, and as strange as it sounds, it's weird if my husband calls me. He usually just texts me. So I picked up right away, and he asked if I had talked to my mom. I said I hadn't. He said I needed to call her. Um, I called my mom as she was arriving to the hospital, and that's when I was told that Claire at her child care had been found unresponsive after a nap, and I didn't really have any other information than that other than I just needed to get to the hospital. Unfortunately, it was a Friday afternoon, and I was going with traffic, and it took a while to get there, and um, vividly remember running in from the valet in the ER and just seeing the social worker shake her head at me, um, and walked into a room, and my husband and um mom and stepdad were in there. And that's when I found out that Claire had passed away. And it was just um, a big blur. We had, I had no idea how she had passed away. You know, at 10 and a half months old, you think that you're kind of out of any risk for a sleep related death. So that's not something that I initially thought. We talked to detectives that night. We weren't allowed to talk to the child care provider. But through the course of the autopsy, which took about eight weeks, we found out that um, it was a sleep-related death and that our child care provider had been putting Claire down to nap on her adult bed in her house without us knowing. We um, had seen the pack and play. That's where we had talked about she would be sleeping. But it, we found out that at about seven months old, the child care provider had decided to switch Claire to a bed. And then we got some second and third opinions from forensic pathologists that specialize in infant deaths. And they are able to go in more detail than like a city medical examiner might be or a county medical examiner. And um, she died from something called rebreathing that I had never even heard of before. Um, She wasn't covered in blankets. She wasn't covered in pillows. But Claire was put down um, and rolled onto her side because that's what babies do, particularly 10 and a half month old babies that are about to start walking any moment. And because of the adult mattress, which is softer than crib mattresses, it created this little air pocket. And um, while she was sleeping, she kept rebreathing the same air in over and over again from that air pocket. And she never woke up. It caused her to asphyxiate. It was just kind of obviously heartbreaking, confusing. We dealt with other obstacles that I won't go into too big of a detail, but with kind of the investigation and how it all went. And um, we did end up filing a civil suit. And I can tell you there's nothing that feels worse than receiving a check in the mail. Um, When your child had passed away, you'd give anything to have your child and not that check. And so we just didn't know what to do with that money. But I started really kind of diving into safe sleep advocacy about a year after this happened. And we decided to put some money away for Claire's big sister's college. And then we sent the rest of the money to the hospital that tried to save her that day. The doctor um, at Mary Bridge, Dr. Walkley, was just amazing and took my phone calls and emails years after Claire 
died. So we sent the money to the hospital with the direction that Dr. Walkley should decide where it goes. And so he sat on that for a while and he then came up with the Claire Rayfield training room. So at Mary Bridge in Tacoma, Washington, there's a high tech CPR training room that has mannequins that are of children, which isn't quite as common. And medical personnel can go and get the most up to date feedback in a makeshift trauma room on intubation, CPR, and it's right out of Grey's Anatomy. I remember seeing something similar once where it gives you in the moment feedback on your technique. And then through that, we were like, you know, this is pretty great. So we started the Claire Bear Foundation. Um, We do safe sleep advocacy. We provide safe sleep spaces for families that can't afford them because I don't think that finances, it's not fair that that might make or break whether a family is able to be as safe as possible as they want. And then we also do a lot of work with Child Care Aware of Washington and Child Care Aware of America with advocacy for Um, safe, accessible, affordable child care for all families. And so we go to Washington, D.C. typically each spring and speak to lawmakers about funding for child care and how important it is. And it's, you know, the, it just obviously can mean life or death as we know. And now I've found that social media is really the outlet for safe sleep information. And it's been um, really rewarding to be able to do all of this in Claire's name. Wow, Shana, that's incredible that you could take something like that and literally be a part of saving other children's lives. I just think that's remarkable. So if we're going to start at the beginning, because as Dina mentioned, we suspect this episode is going to be widely shared. You know, we do have listeners that are still expecting and have newborns, and I suspect a lot of our other listeners will know somebody who does. So if we're going to just start with the basics of safe sleep, what would those be? And I know you have like, it's an ABCs, which we love on the show because we love anything that makes anything simple, especially for parents who are sleep deprived and like, what was that again? So could you share those ABCs of safe sleep? Yeah, absolutely. So the ABCs are alone back crib. So babies alone, meaning nothing else is in their sleep space except for either a swaddle, a sleep sack, and a pacifier is safe to have in there. On their backs, so babies should be put down on their backs in a safe sleep space at the start of every sleep. If a baby rolls over by themselves onto their tummy or side, it's okay for them to stay there, but you want to keep putting them on their backs. And sometimes that's a little confusing because you're like, well, but my child already just rolls over the second that I put them down. Why can't I just put them down on their tummy? And the reason behind that is, well, first of all, looking at data, we know that when babies, for whatever reason, are initially put down on their backs, that science and evidence has shown us that there's a lower instance of SIDS. But additionally, babies just change so much every single day. And what might seem insignificant to us is a little change is very significant to infants. So let's say a baby's sick and just is a little more tired and lethargic than normal. So even though they rolled over by themselves the previous day, they might not have the strength to do that today, which could then leave them in an unsafe sleep situation that they can't get out of if they need to move. So that's why we say the back at every start of sleep. And then the C is crib, but it actually can be a crib certified bassinet or pack and play. Pack and plays can get a little bit tricky because they often have unsafe attachments, but the flat levels of the bassinet both on, or the pack and play both on the top and down below are always safe for sleep. Great. Thank you. That's such a really helpful jumping off point. And I imagine when you're talking about this, there's certainly some people who might resist a little bit, especially if maybe they're using a product that has been deemed unsafe or if they're doing something that they feel really works for their family, but it turns out the data doesn't support it. So I'm curious if you could share with us kind of the most common points of resistance that you hear when it comes to safe sleep and then your responses to those. Yeah. So first of all, I don't judge anyone if they get defensive when they're hearing that the safest practices might not be what they're doing with their child. I think our natural reaction is we want to protect our children. We get defensive. And um, of course, everyone's doing what they believe is best for their child. So to hear someone say, oh, that might not be the safest, it can be intimidating and almost feel like a personal attack when it's not. Probably one of the biggest arguments I hear back is kind of falls under that survivor's bias umbrella where I did it and 
my kids are fine or my parents did it and they were fine. So clearly there's nothing wrong with that. And honestly, that's the biggest one, I think, to get over, especially when you have those same maybe grandparents telling you, I did it and it was fine. Like, don't listen to all this fancy new information that's out there. And anecdotally, they've seen it be fine. So I just often talk about science and, you know, and say it changes over time. Look at car seats that we had 50 years ago versus car seats we had now. And at the time they worked, but now they work even better. So we use what's better um, and what science has shown us to be safest. I think the biggest one, of course, was the rock and play, right? Like that was so popular. It was something doctors were recommending because of the incline when babies had reflux. And then we found out that it was causing infant deaths. And it, the big hard part about it was the company initially came out and kind of blamed it on the parents, said it was user error, had to do with the buckling. And while that might have been true in some of the cases, it was also true that the incline was causing positional asphyxiation, which was blocking off an infant's airway. And um, of course, the company, the manufacturer, didn't come out right away and say that. So by the time that did get out as the reason for the recall, it had already been put out in the air that it was the parents' fault. And I know some of the parents who have lost their children in a rock and play, and they were using it completely as directed. And I just can't imagine what it feels like to be them and read that, you know, in the news of comments that you see of people blaming them. Another big one right now is the docatot. People don't come at me for this one, but the docatot is not safe for sleep either, but people love it. Um, and the docatot, the company itself in their fine print says it's not safe for sleep, but all their pictures advertise it. So it's really hard right now to be a parent and see all this stuff on the market and you see sleepers and nappers and you look at them and you're like, why wouldn't they be safe for sleep? So I think just kind of the business of selling baby products right now is also just a huge obstacle for parents because there's just so much out there and it doesn't make sense that it would be out there and not be safe. Yeah. And such, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head, right? That as parents, we get very, uh, the stakes are so high. The stakes are so high in parenthood. And so we don't want to think that we're making a bad choice. And we also are trying to get our kids to sleep. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious because there have been these things over time, and I love the car seat analogy because it does seem like these guidelines, they shift and they change. So first and foremost, where can parents find the most updated guidelines? Like how would a parent find, you know, th this particular item is not safe? And when can we expect the most updated guidelines? And then finally, how do you advise parents? Because these guidelines are always changing, how can they stay on top of it so they can be sure that they're making the most informed decisions possible? Yeah. So first off, the safe sleep recommendations right now, they're pretty ironclad on those ABCs. But we look back before the early 90s when the recommendations were to put infants down on their tummies. And that's a huge change. So I think that already makes parents weary of wanting to take in all the information because it's like, well, look at, you know, 25 years ago, they were saying that this wasn't safe and now they're recommending it. So that's really difficult. The most up-to-date recommendations are always through the AAP um, and healthychildren.org has all of the AAP guidelines for safe sleep in there um, in a much easier format to understand than if you were to sift through all the different studies with Dr. Rachel. Moon. So uh, just an easy, quick way to look at them is um, at healthychildren.org. For specific products, it gets a little bit harder because they're not going to come out and talk about specific products because there are just so many out there to say yes to this, no to this. You do want to look for standards. So there are CPSC and ASTM standards that are sleep-related but then it gets trickier again because some products will say that they pass CPSC standards, but they don't specify to parents that they're not standards for safe sleep. So we've got CPSC standards for materials and chemicals and flammability and toys. So sometimes they'll say that they meet those standards, but it's kind of deceiving because they're not safe sleep standards. And that's what parents are expecting when they're like, are these safe to use? What are the standards? And a company will come back and give you standards that aren't really what you're asking for. So you want to look for bassinet standards. You want to 
look for cribs or pack and plays with the attachments on pack and plays. You want to make sure it says bassinet in the manual to know that it's safe. Um, a good off the bat clue that something isn't safe is if there's buckles or there's an incline of any kind. You're going to know that those aren't regulated for sleep. And then it sounds strange, but I use my safe sleep evidence based groups on Facebook for amazing resource. There are two of them. One's Safe Infant Sleep and another one is um, Safe Sleep and Baby Care. And I love those groups because you go in them and you ask questions and they don't just tell you, they give you evidence of why that's the answer. And I really appreciate that because it's really confusing to just try and take someone's word for it. But if you can look and see why they have this answer, that's a really exciting thing to do. And with the AAP standards, I wish they were more readily available. You kind of have to look for this information. I wouldn't have any idea about other than the basic ABCs. I wouldn't have any idea about the other parts of it all if it wasn't for me losing Claire. And it's difficult that that information isn't out there. You have to look for it and you kind of have to know what to ask for, which is why um, those groups I find to be a great resource in addition to healthychildren.org. Wow. Yeah, it is a lot to work through for parents, all of those different resources and trying to find it. So I'm curious, what are you seeing right now? What would you say are some of the current things in the news or maybe some current legislation that's coming out around sleep? And how would these new things apply to parents with infants? Yeah, I mean, right now in the news, probably the biggest thing that came out is the guidance from the CPSC to not use nests, which would be those loungers like a dock a or a snuggle me, um, or breastfeeding pillows. So the boppies, the boppy loungers, not to use those for sleep. So the CPSC just came out with a warning. They updated the AAP, updated the Healthy Children website that just warns parents, hey, don't use these for sleep. They're safe for awake time, but we do have reports that they've been linked to infant deaths. In terms of legislation for safe sleep, there isn't much that's new right now. It tends to go state by state. And of course, we can't and won't regulate what parents choose to do behind the doors of their own home with sleep. But child care laws, pretty much most states have safe sleep rules with their child care laws. And then some states like Washington get very specific. Um, the Scarlet Sunshine Act did just get passed by the House and Senate and signed into law, which is an amazing thing. So that That actually has to do, unfortunately, when an infant or a young toddler has already passed away. Right now, it's surprising, but there's no common way to look at infant deaths right now. So what in Pierce County might be marked as sudden unexplained infant death might be SIDS or asphyxiation in a different county, and it just varies state to state so much. And this does have a big impact. It has a big impact on data. Um, Causes of death impact families in terms of insurance. And of course, families also just want answers. And so in the past, we've kind of had this write-off for babies that like, oh, it's SIDS. As a police, as one of our police officers told me during Claire's investigation, he said, babies die all the time and we just don't know. And we're finding out that that's actually not the case. And that when we're able to look more and find more information, we're finding reasons for infant death. And so Scarlet Sunshine Act holds accountability nationally. It provides funding, requires uh, data reporting to Congress, gives grants to different counties to help support them have more robust infant death investigations, which then give the medical examiner more information to make a more thoughtful cause of death determination, which in turn gives us data and evidence to help guide our safe sleep practices. Or if we're finding out eventually that there is some internal mechanism that's causing some infants not to wake up and some infants do, to help hopefully prevent infant death in the future. So Scarlet Sunshine Act is, it's a big thing. Um, One of the main stakeholders in that was John Cahan, who is a senior data analyst at Microsoft, but he also has a guild named after his son who passed away, I think almost 17 years ago now. And he's just, he works with 
Seattle Children's Hospital um, for research, but he also made this big move for Scarlet Sunshine Act. And um, he holds a special place in our heart. He's one of the first kind of other men that my husband was able to open up and talk to about child loss, which I think men often get lost in the shuffle, which isn't quite so fair. But I know my husband was so worried about me that he really didn't initially get to take the time to grieve himself. So just knowing that there was someone like John that was leading that effort led me to kind of trust and put a lot of faith in it. So I do think that that's going to change things and hopefully uh, eventually save some lives. Wow, that's amazing. So I do want to ask about childcare, but before I do, I want to go over because you dropped some amazing resources for parents here. So for when the baby is with them in their home, can you go over those ABCs again, the two places where they can find the up-to-date guidelines and those two Facebook groups, just so that people can kind of jot those down in order? Yeah, definitely. So healthychildren.org, you go there and you can search for many things about infant sleep and it's all AAP information. Um, Rachel Moon actually writes a lot of the blogs herself. She's the leading doctor and researcher with um, SIDS and is a member of the AAP SIDS task force. And um, the two Facebook groups that I love in are Safe Sleep and Baby Care. So that talks about safe sleep as well as baby related things and safe infant sleep evidence based group that is just strictly safe sleep um, they actually some of the moderators of that group work with John Cahan with his guild that I was just talking about so they're definitely have the most up-to-date information we partner with them the safe infant sleep is um, also a nonprofit so we partner with them in a lot of what we do and those groups are great information and it's crazy social media. So something as uh, simple as, as uh, TikTok will have. I know that that's kind of where my social media outreach lies is with TikTok and just doing little videos about infant sleep and sharing the evidence that goes around it. And I know I've connected with a lot of moms in particular that way. And that's actually how we've ended up providing most of our safe sleep spaces are parents that have reached out to us saying, I want to do this, but I just, you know, I don't have the money or what we have doesn't fit in our space. How can we do this? And um, that's where the Claire Bear Foundation comes in. That's great. And the ABCs are alone, back, crib. Correct. Crib. Yep. So alone, place baby on their back every time. But remember, if they roll over by themselves, they can stay there because I know parents get very stressed out when that happens. And they're like, you have to be on your back. You don't have to continue rolling the baby back over. Um, that wouldn't be the same if they weren't in a safe sleep space, but it is true in a safe sleep space. And then a crib, bassinet, or pack and play. Great. Okay. So let's talk about child care providers. So how can a family go about finding a truly safe child care situation for their infant? So Child Care Aware is an amazing resource um, in Washington State. Child Care Aware of Washington, they have a search um, feature for child care. And then right there when you're looking at it, you can also look at a child care's history. So to see if they've had any infractions. And you don't necessarily want to write off a child care because they've had one infraction. It could be something really small as, and coachable that they were able to change. But if you're looking and you're seeing multiple past infractions, that have been written up multiple times for being out of ratio or things that have to do with cleanliness or safe sleep, you're able to look at that, see how they rectified it, and really get good information on the child care. In Washington State, licensed child care is required by law unless you're related or a very close family friend of the family. So even if you're only watching one child, if you're watching them on a regular basis and getting paid to do so, you're required to be license. So this doesn't fall in with like the occasional babysitting or that sort of thing, but more like every single day care. And if you don't, if you aren't licensed, you can still be held to the same standards as licensed care. So it gets a little bit tricky in Washington. But if you ever have any questions about it, Child Care Aware of Washington is just an amazing resource. And if you're outside of Washington State, Child Care Aware of America, you can call them, you can email them. Um, if you would rather do that, then handle everything over the internet. And they're just huge champions of child safety and early childhood education. 
Wow, this is just amazing. It's kind of like an information bomb. I mean, it's a it's a lot to swallow, but really, really helpful. So thank you for all of the practical things too, and all the places people can actually go and find out more. On that note, if our listeners want to learn more about you or connect with you on social media, learn more about the Claire Bear Foundation, can you tell us how to find you, websites, social media handles, all of that good stuff so our listeners can track you down? So our website is theclairebearfoundation.org. And if you were to hit contact us, it's going to go right to me on Facebook and Instagram. If you look up the Claire Bear Foundation, you will find us. We're the first one that pops up. And on TikTok, where I give most of my quick, practical, less than one minute safe sleep tips, it's my name. So Shana Raphael. Perfect. And listeners, just so you know, we'll have all of this on our social media with the post about this episode. So please don't worry if you're wondering like how to spell her name and all of that. We'll take care of it and have it there for you. Thank you so much, Shana, just for sharing all of this with us because we do know it's going to be helpful in keeping babies safe and helping families hopefully not have to experience what you did. So thank you so much. I'm just really appreciative you both had me on here. Wow. Well, I'm so grateful that our listeners are going to have an opportunity to hear that and share that because I do think, I mean, you know, what struck me most was I remember when my kids were in their cribs and they would roll over, I'd go in and roll them back and it was so stressful. So I like that even just that tiny bit of information, like follow those ABCs and make those safe sleep choices. But hey, it's also okay to not be running back in and back and forth all the time. Like that's huge. That's huge for people to know so that they can commit to those ABCs and still make a choice for them that feels, you know, a little more comfortable. I love it. Yeah. And I think that is important too, right? Just giving parents information and empowering them with the information, but without giving them just one more thing in a long line of things to worry about. Because parents do want to be diligent. We we are concerned with safety, but often they're frazzled and overwhelmed. And I think also the places where we can say, okay, but don't worry about that. Like the going back in and rolling baby over, that's, that's important too. And that's essential. All right. So as we head further into 2021, listeners, we want you to be thinking about maybe topics that you'd be interested in hearing about. Here was an example of one today that we hadn't touched on yet and sleep safety is super important. So if you think of ideas for episodes, or maybe you have a question off the back of this episode or others, we really want you to be able to reach us. And if you're new to the podcast, we want to make sure that you can just learn more about our show and about Kira and I. So I'm going to give you both of those. So first, where you can find all about raising adults, all about our parenting philosophy, future-focused parenting, and just a ton of digital resources for your parenting is at our website, and that is futurefocusedparenting.com. Now, if you have a question for us, an episode idea, or other thoughts that just want to touch base with a parent coach, you can email us. And the email is info at futurefocusedparenting.com. We do really love to hear from you, Kira, and I get happy to hear from our listeners. And we often even turn your questions into just a short episode. We call those a spin cycle. For those of you who are new, we used to record together in Kira's laundry room. And so our short episodes are called spin cycles. And we like to take our listener questions and just address those from time to time, because you might be dealing with situations that you're wondering about. And we love to be able to help. Also, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the podcast. It's really easy on your podcast platform to just hit the subscribe button and then you won't miss any of the episodes and any of that content. And we'd also really welcome you following us on social media. You can find us on both Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Future Focused Parenting. We look forward to being back next week with more content for you and really appreciate you tuning in today. Raising Adults podcast is produced by Kira Dorian and Dina Thayer and recorded partially in Kira's laundry room, partially in my coat closet. Editing by Allison Preisinger and music by Seattle band Hannah Lee. Thanks for listening. <laughs>